virtual Northrop Fry Center this year. Thank you all very much for taking the time. I know there is that degree of fatigue, you know, um, with Zoom calls, with all sorts of things, and we are competing for people's time and energy and eyes. But this really is one of the best parts of the of the year for us is to is to continue to hear. We've had one NFC doctoral fellow talk, but now we kind of get into this. Uh, you know, it's almost like a a blast of of research of new research from our amazing doctoral fellows. Um, I'd like to really thank Victoria College for uh, continuing to support the Northrop Fry Center. And of course, Amelia Bailey um, for organizing things and Jamie Quadros for his continued excellence with the uh, visuals for the Northrop Fry Center. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Patrick uh, Marshall, who's a PhD candidate at the Cinema Studies Institute. And the Cinema Studies Institute has been no stranger to the Northrop Fry Center over the last few years. His Ontario graduate scholarship funded dissertation examines the proliferation of the political conspiracy thriller across Europe and America in the 70s by situating the genre in relation to radical and reactionary insurgency, the 1960s and 70s. And his project focuses on the way that this genre deployed the sort of the moral aesthetic codes of melodrama objectivity, discourse of objectivity, of, of documentary and the narrative conceit of conspiracy to explore questions of law, right, and violence in the political sphere and to reposition the, cine, the citizen spectator in relation to the state. Um, his interests include 1970s film theory, obviously political theory and Marxism. Really excited for this talk today, Justice and Shame, the extradiagetic jury of the political conspiracy thriller. Patrick, take it away. Okay, so uh, thanks so much to the Northrop Fry Center for having me. I feel uh, really lucky to have a venue in which to, you know, read and, and workshop stuff I've been working on for, for a while now, siloed as I have been, uh, you know, in my little COVID home. So, um, so thanks in particular to Bob and Amelia for, for making this possible and creating such a hospitable intellectual environment this year, just, you know, given how odd this year has been, I imagine it hasn't been easy, but it's been nice being part of what you guys do. So the talk that I'm giving today obviously um, is derived from the dissertation project that I've been working on uh, for a little while at the Cinema Studies Institute, uh, which is on, um, initially was on the political conspiracy thriller as such. I've kind of been whittling it down and lately uh, it's looking more and more like it will be on just the kind of European cycle of, your, of political conspiracy thrillers that were made in the 1970s. So it was a whole bunch of them. Um, and as I'll say in a moment, there were some like more popular films that came out of America, but there was a European cycle as well. And so that's what the dissertation is on. And the first chapter, which is what I'll be presenting work from today is on uh, the films of the Greek born, but basically French director, Costa Gavras, Konstantinos Gavras, um, whose work was commercially popular. It was, it was really widely available, um, particularly in its moment, like kind of his moment was kind of the seventies and early eighties. But it, it, even though it generated some uh, American film criticism and French film criticism in Cahier and that like, people knew his name, there's very little contemporary scholarship on, on his stuff. So this chapter is kind of my crack at, you know, or, you know, my attempt to like figure out what was happening in those films uh, with the benefit of, of hindsight, you know, writing so many years later on them now. So, uh, so I'll just get into it. Although it is not strictly speaking the first political conspiracy thriller, Costa Gavras' 1969Z is often understood to be one of the most significant early instances of this genre. One that will proceed by just a few years the more well-known 1970s American cycle of films, including The Parallax View, All the President's Men, and Three Days of the Condor, just to name a few of the more popular instances. Oliver Stone, who may be Costa's more contemporary American equivalent, acknowledges Costa Gavras as a hero and as a filmmaker who demonstrated for Stone's generation the commercial and aesthetic viability of a suspense thriller filled with explicit political content of current events. Although Costa's name is not as widely known today, one doesn't need to look very far in contemporary Hollywood to locate the influence he has had on the formation of this subgenre. And although the genre seems to rise and fall in popularity, it remains a mainstay in Hollywood's repertoire. Z, Oh, I've got to share my uh, PowerPoint here. This is just a poster, yeah, one of many posters from the film. 
So Z based as it is on actual historical events and Vasilis Vasilikos 1969 novelization of those events reminds us early on by way of title cards that's, that any similarity to real persons and events is not coincidental, it is intentional. The film then concerns the 1963 plot to assassinate Gregorius Lambrakis and the subsequent investigation of these events. Lambrakis was a doctor, an Olympian and an outspoken anti-war activist or humanitarian who was elected to Hellenic Parliament in 1961 and who was a representative of the United Democratic Left Party in Greece. Because communist parties had been outlawed in Greece, the United Democratic Left was the only legal left-wing party op operational in Greece at this time. This meant that its membership was ideologically capacious, encompassing a range of leftists from party communists to liberal humanists. This is all to say that the position, from the position of the radical left, Lambrakis represented an anti-communist anti liberal humanism, or from the distorted perspective of the right-wing royalist figures who would eventually assassinate him, he was simply a communist. The film then proceeds in five acts. We first witness the assembly of the two camps represented in the film, the right-wing royalists who belong to the military and the left-wing United Democratic Left. The film, in other words, establishes a quasi manichaean perspective almost immediately. This is followed by the assassination itself. In this act, it becomes clear that cash strap working class party lackeys are recruited by the right wing royalists to carry out the plot. The third act is the investigation where we are introduced to the investigating magistrate. The fourth is the deposition and trial where the right wing royalists who, were met, who we met in the first scene are sentenced one by one. And the final very brief act is the epilogue. It is here that we learn amidst the trial that amidst the trial, the prosecutor was mysteriously removed from the case, the magistrate dismissed, a number of key figures, witnesses, and journalists died in suspicious accidents. The assassins received short sentences and police officers involved receive only an administrative slap on the wrist. In other words, the trial failed to deliver justice that it posited as necessary. The 1967 right-wing coup is then detailed and a list of banned items are broadcast, and this is um, in French, as the film is, a list of those items, you know, Euripides, long hair, famously, mini skirts. It's for some reason, Aragon and, and Trotsky are on the same line. There's probably a good reason for that, but I don't know it. Sociology, learning Russian, so on and so forth. In this respect, then, the film sutures the assassination of Lombrakis to the formation of the Greek military junta that would rule Greece from the coup of April 21st, 1967, until 1974, when the regime was finally ideologically and politically gutted. Put otherwise, the film makes the historical claim that the Lombrakis assassination and the coup d'etat of April 21st, 1967, formed two halves of the Greek junta's moment of inscription. That is, the violence wrought by the state in the moment that it establishes its statehood. It is in relation to this moment that the film attempts to do the work I want to claim it is being concerned to do today. Since the investigation and trial were undermined by the eventual coming to power of the junta, and in this respect, since justice for the murder of Lombrakis was never served, the film reenacts the events of history, summoning the ghosts of Lombrakis and other disappeared or murdered members of the left. It does so, however, not for a nationally bounded audience. The film was banned in Greece until 1974 and didn't have a premiere until 1997, I believe. But for an international audience of what Carl Schoonover would call global moral onlookers. As Zainab Derek indicates, those moments of instituting violence like the assassination of Lombrakis and the overthrow of the state to come depend on their quote, ability to produce models of interpretation that make its originary violence appear as right, necessary and legitimate. History in other words, is expected to bestow legitimacy on such acts. Costa's film attempts to intervene in history by broadcasting the moment of state forming violence for those global moral onlookers so that they might shame discredit and delegitimize that act and the state that made it possible. That is to say, in the absence of a successful legal trial, Costa Gavras plays on the structural similarities between the film spectator on the one hand and the jury in a court of law on the other. Both witness what they take to be a representation of the totality of events and exercise moral judgment in relation to what they have seen. The whole that they now have in view is understood to underwrite the sense of fairness with which the jury does its work. With Z, Costa universalizes the institution of the jury by asking viewers to witness the testimony made possible by historical reconstruction for the, shape, the sake of shaming the Greek state. To get us into our position of the extra diegetic jury, finally, 
Costa Gavras offers us a peculiar form of identification. One that is not initially with any character, but with the camera itself. What we get is an all seeing, all knowing perspective that Christian Metz would call the gift of ubiquity. Quite literally a high moral ground from which to objectively apprehend and morally condemn the Greek junta. As it will show, however, in the final acts of the film, this omniscient perspective is handed off to the investigating magistrate before abandoning us, abandoning us entirely. It's around here that some of the problems with the film's tactics begin to emerge, I, I wanna say at least. Tactics which we might say are echoed in, this, echoed in those future instances of the genre. Firstly, in the case of both the court of law and Z, what we are offered is a pseudo totality and an individualizing critique. Just as the court of law is unable to indict the system, of a whole, system as a whole, so too does Costa's film fail to emphasize the hierarchy of dependence between the assassins, again, these are working class citizens, which the film does emphasize, the police, the political authorities, and eventually the Greek palace. Secondly, where the jury in a court of law is agential, the film jury does not have available to it an action to correspond to their judgment. The film jury might seem to be unfettered by the system of bourgeois law that combines the agency of the legal jury, but matters are, matters are not so simple. The sense of moral outrage that Z wants to provoke is wholly continuous with the then emergent logic of human rights and the interventionist policies of imperial nations. The international film spectator witnesses the reduction of rights in a distant nation and is positioned thusly to support the very forms of foreign intervention that would sweep the post-war globe and which would come to be an important mechanism in the spread of neoliberal capital. So just to, just to summarize them, my claim is twofold. One is that, uh, is that the film exposes the originary violence of the Greek military junta by way of reenactment. And thusly, it asks the global viewer to shame the state. And secondly, following from this, since the spectator has no course of action available to, to them to sublimate their outrage, that is to say, since there is nothing that would count for the individual spectator as shaming, the spectator is attuned to an emergent geopolitical order in which foreign intervention, often carried out in the name of human rights, is underwritten and legitimized. The film then establishes a set of formal and spectatorial codes that would be inherited by so many future instances of the genre. All thrillers feature a moral and or legal transgression that must be contained, and in all political thrillers, this threat is either a reactionary or radical threat to the stability of an otherwise robust, fair, and free democratic order. Much like the films that would follow from it, Z brings together a range of genres, modes, and traditions. It is a suspense thriller and so conforms roughly to classical Hollywood narrative structure. The plot is organized by a deadline and although, as I'll soon explore, the film offers a fluid form of identification, characters must act in a precise and timely manner. The film takes on to a degree the melodramatic, Manichaean morality characteristic of the lower instances of Hollywood cinema in its construction of the courts and its representation as seeking justice while the functionaries of the Nationalist Party and their working class lackeys. Insofar then as Z in particular is a docudrama, a story ex excised from history, it both works with and internalizes a discourse of sobriety. We see newsreel footage and we are reminded that the events depicted have actually occurred. Finally then, insofar as the film has ostensibly legal content, it builds a case against a cast of criminals. It presents us with an investigation and a deposition or pretrial. The film takes on important aspects in this respect of what Carol Clover calls the trial movie cycle. It is from Carol Clover's 1998 essay, God Bless Juries, that my talk gets its concept. And it is to that analysis that I would now like to turn. So, in her work on what she comes to call the trial movie, that is to say, um, movies which prominently feature scenes set in and around court case, Carol Clover indicates that these films have two fairly consistent features. The first is that although these films may call into question the legitimacy of the individual lawyer, judge, or bureaucrat, what these films never cast doubt on is the jury's ability to adjudicate. In the overwhelming majority of trial movies, she writes, quote, the unofficial trial on an aspect turns on an aspect of the legal system. Is the system fair across various social differences, uh, class, race, gender? Can it be corrupted? Does money buy people off? Are lawyers human? She writes, can the system really get at the truth? Can it distinguish between technical justice and real justice? What it almost never questions, however, is the institution of the jury. To take on the jury system as a problem, she tells us, would be to repudiate the judgment of citizens and to favor the judgment of professionals. 
a step that no film with mainstream aspirations could afford to take. So this is uh, Carol's first um, claim in her assessment of this genre. Secondly, and this is more of an aesthetic observation, these films tend in most cases to not depict the jury. The jury, she indicates, is oddly invisible. We seldom see them, but when we do, it is only by way of oblique angles and quick cuts. The particularity of the individual members of the jury rarely figures. The omission of the jury from our field of view is, of course, what facilitates the viewer's interpolation. We fill the blank space in the text, she says. Well, there may seem to be important exceptions to this rule, one thinks of 12 Angry Men almost immediately, which is about the jury. Clover not only claims the juryless trial film as the norm, through close reading, she demonstrates that 12 Angry Men's, 12 Angry Men rather participates in this law. But while Clover's examples are American films, falsely accused, compulsion, presumed innocent, and reversal of fortune are just some of her examples, Z emerges from a much different context. Even though the film conforms to her model insofar as it presents us with a criminal case that enters the legal system without at any point offering anything like a jury, that is to say, there's no active collective in the film, Z differs in two important respects. It is not an American film and it is not addressed to a nationally bounded audience, as, as I said a moment ago. This means that not only would the jury as an empirical institution not necessarily be present because although the jury, although the jury is a feature of the American legal system, it is not a feature of every legal system or every um, level of trial. Secondly, the film is addressed not to a national audience who share the same relation to the same institutions and legal norms, even if the legal norms it posits are by this point in history relatively universalized. As indicated earlier, the film is a thinly veiled depiction of the events of Greek history, yet it was made in Algeria with French money, and the film is in French, a choice that Costa Gavras and his screenwriter Georges Sempron acknowledge would allow it to travel globally. Already in this sense, Z resembles more closely global art cinema than typical Hollywood fare. There is that important distinction between the work that Clover examines on the one hand and Z on the other. While Clover interprets the trial movie in strictly national terms, that is to say it is an American genre tradition, which is addressed in its specific instances to American audiences, Z presupposes a global audience. Insofar as the film could not be played in the very nation that it was critiquing, Z if it is a trial movie at all, assembles not a jury with a common national heritage, but a transnational, at least pan-European audience of global onlookers. It is in this respect then that Z is a trial movie, is both a trial movie and also the inheritor of a project put forward, if not begun by the Italian neorealists, at least insofar as that cycle of films has been understood by Carl Swoonover in his important study, Brutal Vision, the Neorealist Body in Postwar Italian Cinema. There, Schoonover draws atten attention to an overlooked aspect of Italian neorealism, its frequent depictions of imperiled bodies. For Schoonover, post -war, uh, sorry, Italian post-war cinema's deployment of images of physically suffering bodies, quote, convenes a global audience of moral onlookers. By examining both their marketing and their mode of address, Schoonover demonstrates that rather than appeal only to national audiences within the border borders of post-war Italy, the Italian neorealist cycle was a genre addressed to viewers far beyond Italy's shores. As Schoonover elaborates, Italian neorealism was well suited to participate in a larger cultural trend towards exposing the scale of human violence of the Second World War. But this exposure, he explains, comes at a cost. While this vocation may seem to be aligned with leftist humanitarian politics, or what folks understood that to be in that moment, Italian neorealism's interest in depicting the brutalized human body signals the genre's participation in an ultimately flawed emergent politics of liberal compassion that Schoonover calls brutal humanism. Put simply, images of people suffering travel well and can be used to marshal support on a global scale for the interventionist policies like the Marshall Plan and pro-free market NGOs. That is to say, the work that these images do ultimately comes to serve the proliferation of global capital, a maneuver that would have massive repercussions in the last quarter of the 20th century and beyond. Z, I want to say, inherits from neorealism the project of assembling a global audience of moral onlookers and additionally, despite its overt politicality, that is its shaming of the Greek military junta by relating the violence and illegitimacy of its founding moment, it too may serve as a vehicle for interventionist policies in Z's moment, at uh, the early 1970s, which is a much different moment than the, the conjuncture of Italian neorealism, the moment in which that appeared, which would be the 1940s, 1940s and 50s. That is to say, as Jessica White tells us in her study, The Morals of the Market, 
By the early 1970s, the post-war interventionist policies of the 1940s and 1950s had begun to congeal into a much more integral part of the logic of a global and globalizing capital. As White tells us, although human rights NGOs, quote, came to prominence in the 1970s precisely for contesting the torture and disappearances that accompanied neoliberal shock treatment in the Southern Cone, they almost immediately embraced the central neoliberal dichotomy between commercial or civil society understood as the realm of freedom, volunteer, voluntary interaction, and distributed or private power that check the centralized power of the state on the one hand, and politics understood as violent, coercive, and conflictual on the other. White said, sorry, uh, White cites Kenneth, Kenneth Roth, the director of US-based Human Rights Watch to describe the methodology of human rights NGOs in this moment, which resembles in striking terms, the work that Z and the political conspiracy thriller do. Quote, it consists in the ability to, and this is Roth, to investigate, expose, and shame. That involves identifying a particular violation, a specific violator, and a clear remedy. This has made these NGOs both reluctant and unsuited to challenge the structural and impersonal effects of market processes, she writes. Nevertheless, while supposedly eschewing coercion, major human rights NGOs have been quite prepared to call on the military might of the most powerful states to intervene in the name of securing human rights and universalizing a distinctive moral order. This is the enforcement of human rights by way of coercion. In the process, they often align with the neoliberal embrace of a quote, strong security state stripped of its social capacity so as to protect the market and enforce the morals of the market across the globe. And this is kind of um, White's argument in this book. Z's global motive address is evident not only because it was made in a different nation than the one that it is ostensibly about, and not only because it was made in French so that it might travel well. Like many art films, Z actually did play to global audiences, as evidenced by these posters advertising the film in France, America, Italy, and Japan. Just as the transnational paraphernalia for Italian neorealist films emphasized their focus on brutal humanism, in some cases, and began the paratextual work of assembling their global audiences, so too was Costa Gavras's Z advertised globally with posters that foreground the film's climactic moment, moments of bodily victimization. Indeed, a central aspect of the film's counter-historical project is the representation of those violent moments and micro moments of history that elude the camera. The advertisements for the film emphasize one of two moments in the film, the scene in which Lombrakis is fatally struck and the scene appearing towards the end of the film in which one of Lombrakis' right-hand men is pursued in, north, in a North by Northwest style chase sequence. With respect to the grammar of these posters and we're given um, a Kafkaesque image of bodily dislocation, a claustrophobic depiction of the body of Lombrakis from an angle oddly reminiscent of Hans Holbein's The, the Body of Dead Christ in the Tomb. That's the one on the, on the right side there. Um, a range of posters which emphasize the film's adoption of, an, of that North by Northwest style chase sequence. And, um, and Lombraki's suffering body being supported by the hands of what seem to be varied onlookers. There's also an Italian poster here, which um, uh, you may notice <laughs> the translated title of the film in Italy was not just Z, but Z, the orgy of power for, for better or for worse. That's what, that's what they called it. <laughs> um, so Italian neorealism on Schoonover's reading is a potent form of political cinema. Rather than depend on resolute refusal of identification, as would be the case with what is basically synonymous with political cinema, cinema today, that is uh, what we call political modernism, stuff like Godard's work in, in the 70s um, and a little bit beyond. Neorealism plays on the viewer's moral responsiveness, just like, just like Italian neorealism did. Sorry, neorealism plays on the viewer's moral responsiveness. That's what I wanna say. Appealing to the viewer's sense of virtue by way of a melodramatized realism is a powerful means by which to assemble a global audience precisely because the viewer, what the viewer witnesses takes place in another world, one that is not strictly speaking accessible, accessible to us in the here and now. The fact that I can't do anything about the condition of these suffering others, the fact that my feeling is, that my feeling is not actionable even though an ethical claim is made on me, seems to be precisely the element that infuses this form of relationality between spectator and, and someone they see suffering in narrative cinema. Um, 
In this respect, Schoonover's description of the ethical power of neorealism can be clarified by way, uh, sorry, by reference to Stanley Cavell's understanding of what it means to be a spectator witnessing characters who are in pain. In The Avoidance of Love, Cavell's essay on King Lear and his most sustained exploration of the conditions of spectating, he inquires into the peculiar form of relationality between spectator and suffering character. What he asks there is the existence of a character on the stage. What kind of grammatical entity is this? First of all, he says, the character is not aware of us, so the relation is one-sided. Secondly, the character is in our presence when they suffer, or since the character is in our presence when they suffer, a claim is made upon us to acknowledge that suffering. Only we can't, as Cavell puts it, we know we cannot approach him, and not because it is not done, but because nothing would count as doing it. Put another way, he says, they and we do not occupy the same space. There is no path from my location to his. For Cavell, what we do share with the character is time. And it is from here that Cavell is able to use this more particular scene, the scene in King Lear that he's looking at and the scene of tragedy in which a spectator encounters someone who is suffering or a character who is suffering. Um, it, it's, it's by way of this that he's able to, um, for, for, sorry, so for Cavell, what we do share um, with the character is, 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 is not space and a world, but time. And so it's from here that Cavell is, used to, is able to use this scene to explore the conditions under which we are compelled uh, by what we see not only on stage in theater, but um, also on screen in the cinema. So as he elaborates in the world viewed, quote, in viewing a movie, my helplessness is mechanically assured. I am present not at something happening, which I must confirm, but at something which has happened. Movies, in other words, are interesting and compelling and have significance for us. That's, you know, the kind of central question for Cavell. Why do movies have, why do they matter to us? Because we see things we would normally feel compelled to respond to or to acknowledge in Cavell's language, but that we can't, or that there's nothing that would count as acknowledgement here. Scenes of suffering intensify and explicitize the peculiar interplay of burden and release from burden that we experience in the movies. That is to say, if the central problematic of 1970s film theory was the Althusserian inflected question, how am I duped by the imaginary representation of reality? The question that Cavell encourages us to pursue is slightly different. It's how is, a form of, how is the form of moral responsiveness that the cinema allows for or provokes different than that experienced outside of the cinema? What I'm interested in here then uh, is the blockage that we conventionally experience when confronted with images or representations of human um, or non-human for that matter, suffering. I would only add to this that the peculiar ethical burden that is placed on the spectator is mitigated by the device of narrative closure, where the wrong is punished in the narrative or otherwise addressed and set right. The burden on the spectator is eased and the spectator is free to forget what they have witnessed. Or, or this is some version of what we, we conventionally tend to say when we talk about narrative closure. Um, and following from this, where the narrative, where narrative closure is not offered, as is the case in tragedy, then, as we often point out, again, in our ordinary ways of regarding such things, the spectator is burdened by the sense that something must be done. Or as Schoonover puts it, quote, we are left longing for outside help for someone to adjudicate and regulate this world. Indeed, this burden or sense that something must be done will be more intense the closer the depicted events resemble some version of reality, as is the case with C or any docudrama, really, or documentary for that matter. The question with respect to Z that this leads to then is, how does that form of moral responsive, responsiveness cultivated in the cinema, one that is not strictly speaking actionable, since there is nothing, as Cavell tells us, that would count as responding to characters, find expression outside the cinema? Z poses these questions in peculiar and particular way because of its documentary content. When I see the suffering partisan on screen and understand their struggle to belong to the same empirical reality that I belong to, and experience the unconsummated moral burden made possible by the camera which shows me this, how might this burden or blockage be transformed into activity? Or is there a form of activity that corresponds to this? If we see activity not as a direct acknowledgement of the other's pain, but as Schoonover uh, encourages us to, as simply being attuned to and willing to support an organized geopolitical force like global capital, which by the early 1970s is beginning to predicate its universal, universal appeal on the grounds that it would bestow human rights and therefore freedom from the repressive state's violent incursions, if we see activity as this, 
then we can see Z as participating in, even if unwittingly, in the, or, or can we see Z uh, participating, even if unwittingly, in the expansion of global capital? And even worse, if the very regime that Z denounces is one made possible by that expansion, does the film undermine its own goals? Cavell helps us to better understand the moral emotional motive address of the cinema, one that is particularly potent in the films which, in films which are A, violent, and B, have some documentary relation to the spectator's own historical political universe. Cavell details I want to say here is the ethic which animates not just the experience of the spectator witnessing tragedy on stage or on screen, but also both the politics of pity described by Spoonover and perhaps more strikingly, the ethic of the film jury is described by Clover. An apparently disinterested subject is called on to witness evidence of some wrong. The wrong can be addressed in the moment of its occurrence, but where guilt is established, the affective investment in righting the wrong can be transformed by way of the jury's vote into justice. That is to say, in the absence of narrative closure, we are called on to judge what we have witnessed. And it is with this insight that I would like to import to look at the important role of the camera in fostering the kind of identification that would be necessary to interpolate the viewer as an informal jury. So Z positions its audience as members of an extra diegetic jury is, is kind of what I've been, been attempting to, to argue or at least saying so far. It does this instantly by indicating to them that what they are expected to do and what they're expected to do and how they will be able to see with the help of the camera and in keeping, the journal, in keeping with the journalistic ethos of the film, what was once opaque will become transparent. This new transcendental perspective makes the extra di diegetic jury, that is us, into all seeing and all knowing adjudicators of the moral wrongs that it depicts. To do this, the film opens on this shot, which, uh, this shot which is rendered transparent by lens focus. In its opening beats, in other words, the film establishes the form of identification that the film will instantiate a hovering and mobile identification with a camera and a perspective which exceeds any particular character. That is to say that the film withholds identification with a particular character through most of its diegesis rather than offer a hero with whom we, might, we will identify. Z in this way indicates that we are one with the camera just as in a trial when diverse perspectives come together to form a totality. The audience of Z is offered a disembodied perspective from which to observe the events of history. In terms offered by Christian Metz, Secondary identification, identification with particular characters is collapsed into primary identification, identification with the apparatus. Put otherwise, the film plays on what Metz calls the cinema's famous gift of ubiquity, what I referred to earlier, and that is the sense of omnipotence um, in which we possess the camera's potential to capture the world in its totality. In the cinema, in any case, I am unbounded and reconstituted by the camera. Z only doubles down on this by initially offering no no sustained positive identifications with characters in the film. Thusly, the dynamic of primary identification whereby identify with the camera is a form of identification at play through much of the film. Okay. I'm gonna skip over um, this next point, which is just that this, the next sequence um, draws this direct parallel to um, a sequence from Eisenstein's October in which uh, Eisenstein has this montage of religious um, and like state idols and icons and the way in which he brings them together suggests that um, religion like the state are sort of hollow ideology and and Kosugavras kind of mimics this in the beginning of, of his film. Um, so when the film proper starts then once we actually get into the narrative after this opening montage and we meet the antagonists we are made privy to a scene that any diegetic jury could not possibly have witnessed. We witnessed the right-wing ideologues in a closed room meeting where military figures using, using metaphors derived from biology, detail the logic from which their planned assassination will derive its legitimacy. The leftist is compared to a disease and nation state to a plant afflicted by the disease. To maintain the good health of the nation state, the disease must be expunged. The state is founded, in other words, on a constitutive exclusion or what Chantal Mouffe calls the drawing of a frontier between us and them. Those who belong to the demos and those who don't. Hence the camera cuts from member to member whose boredom and exhaustion and lack of commitment we witness firsthand. We even see a party member disinterestedly sketching the royal family's crest in an echo of the uh, metal sequence. From the beginning of the film then, as Clover herself acknowledges, the extra diegetic jury is positioned as more omnipotent than any jury could ever be. The following sequence in which we meet the United Democratic Left only confirms further the film's intention to keep the audience's perspective and identification in line with the camera 
rather than any particular figure in the film. Here, before Lombrakis even appears in the film, we see his assistant struggle to locate a venue, um, to locate a venue for their upcoming event. We first see them being told by the venue manager that they're no longer able to use the venue that they had already begun to decorate in advance of the evening's event. Just as they, ra just as they raise the perhaps paranoid possibility that someone has intervened, the camera pans twice to reveal a conspiratorial figure lurking behind a newspaper, which is not visible to, Lim to Lombrakis' assistant, but is visible to the camera. The camera's omniscience and therefore power is established and the audience is encouraged to take it on as the film's point of identification. The stakes of the viewer's identification with the camera and the all seeing, all knowing quality that is given by this position are intensified as the story progresses and as the whole comes into view. No jury would have a map linking the particular in general, five wide ranging acts encompassing a large cast of primary, secondary and tertiary characters and the many moments that constitute the unfolding of history at their disposal. But the extradiagetic jury is a different entity and because of its constitution by the apparatus, its identification with the camera, it is given the totality or something like it. Oops. I want to turn now to one final sequence of the film and that is the investigating magistrate uh, pictured here, his investigation. It's here that the dynamism of the film's identificatory procedures is realized. The viewer's identification is initially allied not with a particular character through most of the film. There is no one who is agential enough or psychologized enough to support identification. Even Lombrakis, who is more of a Christ-like figure, only appears 15 minutes into the film, and although he's confident and admirable, he is struck and rendered unconscious by the 30-minute mark. The viewer's identification, then, is with the camera, which is capable of being anywhere in the private meeting spaces of the right-wing and left-wing representatives, with the assassins, with the journalists, and anyone else we may meet. The investigation sequence, however, indicates that omniscience is not only transpatial, capable of being anywhere, but also transtemporal, capable of being anywhere at any time. In the fourth act of the film and final act of the narrative proper, when the investigating magistrate interviews suspects and witnesses, the film uses a flat flashback structure to return to the events surrounding the murder of Lombrakis. Suddenly then the omniscient narration that was only available to the spectator via the inhuman apparatus of the camera is handed off to the investigating magistrate. He is investigated with the power to assemble diverse perspectives in order to produce the truth and hence he becomes momentarily the figure with whom the spectator identifies. That is, all of the power and agency that was once the cameras alone has now been invested in the body of the investigating magistrate. Um, okay, importantly, the investigating magistrate is not allied with the United Democratic Left based as he was on the real person of Christos Sartizakis. The magistrate, the film suggests, dons something of a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, bracketing his own commitment to anti-communist nationalism and fully embodying his duty to apply the law to those who seek political ends through extra legal or coercive means. So although he is ideologically aligned with what the film establishes as the enemy, his position is post-ideological in his role in the legal apparatus. When we give up on our ideological commitments, not only do we see more clearly, we see the whole. The dichotomy that the film had established between left and right now becomes one between legal and illegal. Importantly, however, the film does not conclude with the investigation, trial or sentencing. Rather, the very person who embodied the omniscient perspective, and hence the viewer's point of identification, we're told in the epilogue, is discharged from his position. The trial is disbanded and the very figures who were responsible for Lombrakis' assassination are vindicated by history. That is to say, our identification is once again released. Although the state's legal apparatus is posited as the ultimate good, it is not posited as adequate to the task of containing the threat. Whether the threat is the right-wing nationalists or insurrectionists of any ideological position. So pulling the rug from under the viewer uh, then positions the viewer perfectly to desire some extra national act of justice with our identificatory point having abandoned us. We are left unraveled by the film and left longing for someone to adjudicate and clean up this mess. This, as I have been arguing, is exactly the role that will be provided by human rights NGOs in the years to come. And so more than just positing the national law is good, the extra diegetic jury is made receptive to the interventions of NGOs whose guiding ideology is quickly becoming a vehicle for the spread of neoliberal policy. The Greek genta is not rejected on the grounds that they are nationalists who seek to naturalize hierarchy, but on the grounds that they are violent, too political and must be contained by international intervention. If, as de Tocqueville wrote, the jury is not just a little like the judge, but that they take on the judge's, quote, habits of mind, habits of order, taste for forms, and a sort of instinctive love of, a re of regular sequences of ideas, 
If, as he writes, the jury instills in all classes a respect for juridical decisions and the idea of law, which extends beyond the courtroom, and if Costa Z asks us to play jury, then we can see how the film brings into being a, the identification between jury or audience on the one hand and judge or legal system, suturing us into this system. Only with the national legal system swept away at the end of the film and, the sh and shaming the only action available to morally outraged spectators in a world where the only extra national authority is the emergence, emerging hum hu sorry, human rights NGOs, which is itself now being hitched to the project of neoliberal global capital, looking to marshal support for its emerging cause. The film, despite its ambitions to re-narrativize the violent founding moments of the Greek state, comes in its content and its form to prop up a form of politics without politics, that is assimilable to the interests of global capital. What, after all, is a view from which the totality is visible in the 1970s, if not the imperial, now neoliberal gaze? Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, Patrick. That was, uh, that was really, really good. And I really liked, yeah, how you balanced the theory and also showed us um, those, those clips. Thanks, We've got time for uh, questions or concerns or as usual here at the NFC, any, uh, any complaints, but they're usually re reserved for me. I guess we can, we're a small enough group that you can, you can just unmute, you can uh, unmute yourselves and ask if you like, or we can put it in the chat. Um, I'm happy to start. Brian, thanks. Thanks, um, Patrick, thank you. That was really great. Um, I, I really, um, I really like the idea quite a lot uh, of thinking about the political efficacy of this film on a global level in terms of shame. Um, I think that's really interesting and not the least of which because I think in some ways it also brings into focus like that is what the function of something like NATO is really like that it has, it can produce a kind of shaming effect more than any sort of concrete political intervention most of the time, uh, or at least there's always been trepidation, right? That's the kind of problem uh, that's always been built into NATO. Um, but it, it raises a question and it, uh, for me about the global dimension. And I think it's really interesting. And so this is not, uh, this question is not born of skepticism, but of just a curiosity about what it will take to really define shame conceptually at a global level. Because on the one hand, at a national level, uh, we can see always the difference that shame can make politically and that it actually can have, like as this kind of first uh, sort of effective outpouring, right? Um, it can have a hegemonic effect, right? That will force legislators to, to, to change the law, right? In, in this or that way. Um, but shame is also very slippery, right? So for example, one of the examples that I, that I really like, uh, and I may have told you this before, but the, um, I think it was 10 years or so ago in, in Ohio, uh, Ohio passed a law uh, that basically said that if you had been uh, arrested uh, for a DUI, uh, you could drive again, but you, in the first offense, but you would have to have a different license plate. So one that would be burgundy and gold. And so theoretically, you could be driving down the road and perhaps as people know, right, burgundy and gold is also the colors of the Cleveland Cavaliers, right, the Cleveland's basketball team. So you could be driving down as a kind of DUI offender, right, and somebody might honk their horn and wave at you. And you might think, oh, this is great, right? Solidarity, like another drunk driver. Uh, when in fact, it might just be a Cavs fan, right? So it's very difficult in some ways to find the ways in which we can account for um, not agreement, right? Because agreement can be sort of tabulated numerically in some sense, right? Enough people who seem to sort of agree, but sometimes we agree uh, to things that we don't even know that we're disagreeing upon. And, uh, and I think that shame could be one of those areas. And so I'm just wondering then uh, at a national, so even on a kind of small state level, right? Not the nation state, uh, there's a lot of variability when we think about the public character of shame. Um, so then how do you deal with it, you know, at the national level? level, right? Because I think we know, of course, uh, with filmmakers, that's always been an interesting uh, problem, right? Especially within China, if you think of somebody like Zhang Yimou, you know, who started out his career in the early 80s making films that were quite critical of China, um, but they were never seen in China, right? And of course, he stopped making films that were critical of China and started to make blockbusters within China. Um, but that meant that there was a kind of slow trickle effect, right, of people who would have some awareness about uh, Chinese history, Chinese politics on the basis of Zhang Yimou's films, um, but it wouldn't necessarily produce the kind of volume, right, uh, or necessarily a sense of consensus, you know, among different states, even about how to think about China, let's say. So, I mean, how, so I guess one question is then how, how might you conceptualize shame, right, in the sense, say, that uh, if we think about shame as, uh, in its most basic sense, as 
uh, that I've done something, right? I feel shame if I've done something that's at odds with the image that I keep of myself, right? How do you then account for that? Uh, like one can kind of move towards a sort of some basic national uh, characterization, right? In terms of self-regard and self-image, maybe. But then how do you deal with that at a global level, right? Or does it matter? Is it just enough that there's a kind of audience in which shame takes the place of actual, you know, juridical work in, in some sense? Great, thanks for the question, um, Brian. I, I guess I would put it this way. So um, I think it might be better to describe what I'm calling shame as the will to shame. So shame as a verb rather than like a subjectively felt state, because as we know, yeah, like something like shame, um, there's a great deal of contingency to affective experience and that can change from nation to nation. But if the film is attempting to produce and you know, emphasis here is on the film's attempt to produce a will to shame in the spectator. Um, I think that if that will to shame follows from images of violence, um, which as you know, I'm drawing on Schoon over here wants to say, and I think, I think we could probably all agree with this, that images of violence circulate globally uh, while they're legible, um, you know, in at least westernized cultures as we're uh, representing the same kind of thing, or at least state violence is. Um, and so in that case, um, I think I want to say that, that, you know, that the, that the aspirations of this film to uh, inculcate in the spectator this will to shame does travel globally, um, you know, fairly easily and isn't hindered by the, the contingencies of, of emotion and feeling. I, I don't think that that would hinder other, um, you know, more subjectively held affects. And I'm also using shame in a somewhat looser sense here where, you know, it's the will to discredit um, or just like to, to, to be morally outraged and do something about that. Thanks. Makes sense. Thanks. Great. Uh, James Cahill, please. Hey, uh, great work, Patrick. Really enjoyable. Sorry, I'll try to put my hand down while I'm asking this question too. Um, I, have, I have what might be a really simple question. It may have been my dog started barking and I may have just missed, um, you know, shamefully uh, the, the, this precise subtle detail, um, which is, um, you know, there's, there's a way in which I see some rhymes with like Jameson's views on cognitive mapping and yep. the issue of representability and, you know, he goes to the conspiracy theory as, you know, one of the key examples of cognitive mapping. Um, and, um, you know, and with cognitive mapping, it's about that, you know, find the local and connect it to these global systems that are beyond perceptibility, right? Beyond the, the like readily apprehendable by rational thought or by our kind of current perceptual faculties. So my question would be, and this, again, you may have answered this and it may be really simple or it may just be so pedantic it's embarrassing. But um, my question would be in thinking about this notion of the alignment with the camera as giving us a kind of access or to use your terms now, will to totality, right, to some sort of view of the bigger picture. Um, is this reliant on a kind of ideology of the visible that in every single framing throughout the film is also being troubled by what in suture theory we'd call the absent one or l'absent? I mean, like, to what extent does, does this kind of access to totality rely on the ideology of the visible or is it a, a kind of metonymy or, or, or um, some other relationship to other ways of apprehending what is beyond typical sense perception. Um, I'll take my question off air. I love the paper, by the way, and exactly what uh, Bob had said about its integration of theory and the real particular. Uh, that was nice. Thanks, James. Okay, so um, like, yeah, obviously um, th there's some resonance with James's way, or not James is you, Jameson's uh, conception of the of the of the political conspiracy thriller, which is you know probably the most um, dominant um, and you know maybe one of the only formulations of the genre as a whole. And this film is doing similar work to the films that Jameson kind of bases his analysis on, but it's also uh, uh, quite different in important respects. And and so. Um, and so like you, you, you have the kind of like in both cases of Z and the American films that, that, um, that Jameson is looking at a mapping function, but um, uh, in, the in the case of Z, 
the parts that it brings together are a little bit different. The corporation is not a character in the same way in this film as it is in something like the parallax view. Um, but you, the, where the resonance is, I want to say, is in the way that um, the, the way that this film offers in the same way that the films that Jameson looks at, and in the same way that Jameson wants to say this, something like a degraded totality. And so it is, it's kind of like a pseudo totality. So it, it, it allows us to, you know, witness uh, large scale historical events from various perspectives. It then brings those perspectives together and offers us the whole, um, but what the film doesn't do and what it would do if it offered us the, 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 the actual totality. And I think Jameson would say as much is it would give us some sense of the way in which class stratification plays into and makes all of this possible. Rather, it kind of, the trouble with the film, I guess, you know, what I wanna say is one of the problems with it is it mostly stays at the level of the state and doesn't situate itself like in a larger dialectical totality, historical totality. Um, so, you know, in that respect, it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot like what Jameson describes, but the stakes um, obviously are, I think a little bit different, or at least the, the stakes in my project are a little bit different than the stakes for Jameson. Okay. Any other questions for Patrick? If not, I, I'd just like to ask you a little bit, uh, Patrick, if you could just expand a little bit about the sovereignty of the jury. Um, you know, you make this sort of connection between, you know, the viewer, the spectator, um, and the camera, and you kind of project this to sort of the omniscience, but also outside of the, you know, at the international level. Does the suturing in and our identification with that investigating magistrate complicate that, you know, the end game at all? Or do you find that the sort of, you know, what you, what you kind of point to the rise of the sort of neoliberal um, humanitarian sort of doctrines is that going to wash it out anyway? Um, so yeah, like the dynamic is kind of like we're identified with the camera and um, kind of doing like the jury-like work that we would do in a court of law, but as spectators in the cinema. And the thing that makes that possible um, is the camera, say in the same way that like evidence in a court of law um, or you know witness testimonials would make that possible. Um, and so, yeah, I think there, there is a kind of like utopian moment in this also, or a moment of sovereignty where it's like we exercise our own moral judgment or whatever as spectators, just as a jury would, uh, or as a jury seemingly would, a seemingly, you know, formally free to judge uh, jury would. Um, but then importantly, and in this kind of rhyme with, um, with what happens with actual juries, obviously I'm not claiming that the spectator is an actual jury because they're two totally different spheres with different rules and so on and so forth. But um, in the same way as, you know, de Tocqueville wants to say, the jury ultimately is like, they're all, every member of the jury is like a little, um, uh, a little judge basically, and takes on the values and the way of seeing uh, and, and, you know, the kind of point of view of the state that the judge takes on in the same way that happens in the court of law. The film kind of like cleans all that up uh, or all, all of the divergences in perspective that may come about by offering us an identification with the investigating magistrate towards the end of the film before then abandoning that perspective at the very end, um, you know, leaving us with that sense that as, as Gunnar says, you know, we need some form of intervention uh, to do something about what we've seen because we don't have any form of agency available to us to address okay. a problem Okay, so it kind of gets, yeah, it gets taken away. Okay, um, Mint, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, first of all, I, Patrick, I love the paper and uh, have so many things I want to talk to you about that are more tangential than are appropriate here. Um, I'm, I, I, all of this discussion has me thinking about um, some of Slavoj Žižek's comments about all the president's men uh, and how just absolutely liberal and distasteful he finds it and how I've never, that's never sat quite right with me. Um, like I can understand the critiques of, of Parallax View and Days of Condor and uh, um, and the conversation because they, they end in this kind of like in the sense of hopelessness there is no solution and it can lead to this foreclosure uh, of activity um, but I've always kind of felt that uh, journalistic films offer a, a different mode of thinking through these kinds of problems of the political conspiracy because we are imbricate like we are closer to for, first of all because it's a domestic sphere like uh, whether I mean, we're Canadian viewers here potentially, but American audiences watching American journalists, they could foreseeably take on that role in real life and do that kind of work. Um, that there is some sense of 
the domestic connection, um, allowing for allowing for a kind of action that might actually be more politically viable than the kind that is proposed in these other modes that do create this sense of foreclosure where you have, we're being willed to shame the, the junta, but there's no actual way to do that. And so, yeah. this, like, I, like I said, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this as a question, but I'm wondering yeah. if there is, um, if part of the reason that you have kind of uh, specified your, your project to be looking at this kind of European cycle, but it's like festival cycle of filmmaking um, that, that is intended for a global audience is that there might be some way for, there might be some circumstance where films within a domestic market have more leniency in, in promoting some kind of political action. Does that make sense, question-wise? Uh, I see where you're going, but I wonder if you could say anything more about, um, in, in terms of a, a prompt or question, what you're wondering. I, I think I've got a bit something of a response for you. Would, okay, so, Imagine Z is able to be screened in Greece in 69 is kind of my question is what would the film read yeah. differently in that circumstance, yeah. I, I guess, is the, the way that I'm uh, phrasing this. Yeah, it, it's a difficult question to answer because it, if, it, if it were able to be screened in Greece, then certain elements of the film wouldn't be elements of the film. Um, so like, here's how we'll put it like um, the film, you know, like I said earlier, there is this kind of like, uh, you know, I guess what Jameson would call utopian moment to the solution that it proposes to the problem that it examines. Uh, and that is the way in which um, it initially posits, you know, no one um, in the diegetic world that it presents as, as capable of politicizing and taking on uh, as agents the problems that it figures but asks, in a certain sense, the people uh, to do that, um, you know, in the same way that, that, that some of those American films would do or whatever. Um, but um, then, you know, with the dynamic identifications that the film um, makes available to us, or, you know, kind of forces on us in a way, I guess I'll say, the, the, the audience is sutured back into the system that it posits, um, the legal system, in this case, not on, on, a, on a national level, but on an international level. And so I think that like, you know, if we can imagine this case where the film um, was addressing strictly a, a nationally bounded audience, I think that it would come to say very much the same thing. That is to say, the problem is not um, nationalism, but um, this violent uh, coterie of deeply politicized individuals who got together and did some terrible stuff. Um, and now what we need to do is apply the law to contain that problem. And so then, so, you know, I should also say, I'm measuring this against two things. I'm measuring this against what's happening in Europe and globally at this moment, protest movements that are, are seeking to, not to legitimize, but to deploy extra legal means um, to realize political goals. But secondly, and this is a kind of imminent critique, the film kind of undermines its own critique because the thing that it, that it, um, that it wants to suggest that will come in and kind of save the day is ultimately connected, and this is the larger totality that the film doesn't offer us in, in giving us the pseudo totality, it doesn't give us the whole, um, it is that same system that makes the problems that the film examines uh, possible. And so there's a contradiction in the film, there's a contradiction between the film, between the film on the one hand and between uh, you know, what's happening in this moment and with what I'm interested historically in what's happening in this moment. And so, I don't know, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Great. Um, we also have a, a comment from uh, YouTube. Would the grand jury not be a better comparison than the trial jury in this regard? Grand jury's knowledge is absolutely limited by prosecutor and trial. Defense gets a chance. And uh, Matt Hauska says he uh, appreciates the uh, metaphor. Maybe this is quibbling or s splitting hairs and the metaphor might only make sense in the US. I think it also is interesting, the, the um, prosecutor, like the investigating judge, right? System that they have in Europe, like in France and Spain and presumably Greece, where you have a magistrate who acts as an investigator too. I wonder you know, how that might tie into the mixing of the metaphors. And um, you know, I guess I'll put it this way, like, oh, sorry. Sorry, Bob. No, no. My, I, I was kind of losing you. My connection is not so good at the moment. No, if you'd like to comment on that. And then the other thing I will just slip in is that 
you know, you're positing that the, the film might kind of uh, undo itself, Jorge Semprún would probably not be happy to hear that. He was such a dedicated communist and, uh, you know, living in France, but as a Spanish, as a Spaniard living in France in exile. Yeah, Semprún wrote uh, like a number of these types of films and like, um, I, I haven't been able to find that much on Semprún, but uh, Costa Gavros was kind of like belonged to this um, post Am I still with you? Now you are. You froze a little bit. But, uh, maybe um, maybe we shouldn't post our push our luck too much longer. <laughs> okay. So Costa Gavras belonged to this kind of like post-war um, generation of politicized progressives, um, you know, who basically were, um, you know, by that point in their lives, kind of uh, if not ambivalent, then then. Uh, downright dismissive of, of communism. And so they were trying to seek, you know, these kind of like new left style alternatives um, to, you know, the real politics that were taking place at that time. And so like, it, it's all um, well-meaning and so on and so forth, um, but there are contradictions that emerge. Okay, that's the thing on them. The, the, like, the, um, I take your point, Matt, and you know, it, it's it's interesting to think about the, the kind of like distinctions. I don't think that you're quibbling or, or just splitting hairs when we think about the, the differences between you know, different types of juries. But the metaphor that I'm taking, like in, in Carol Clover's case, she's looking at, at American films, which have this sort of specific relation, both in their content and to the audience that they're addressing. Um, uh, this sort of specific historical connection. And so there the differences may come to matter. Whereas here, I think anyways, what I'm arguing is that the jury simply functions um, is, is functioning as something like a metaphor. And that is to say, just a global audience that is assembled who is asked to judge on some level, um, you know, what they see on screen. And then, you know, following from that, how, do the di how does this, the dynamic form of identification or like lack of identification even that the film offers, how does that function to contain those judgments? Uh, you know, I guess is the important question that emerges uh, for me out of this metaphor of the jury. Great, uh, Mike. Did you? I, did I see you raise your hand? Did you have a question? Uh, more an observation, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe perhaps uh, I, I was there. Moment. <laughs> yeah. Could I have seen the film in Toronto in '69? Uh, summer of '69, because I believe I know I saw the film in Toronto, but I think I saw it in '69. Is that? chronologically correct or might it be a bit early? I'm not totally sure. I was looking at the release dates the other day. I think it came out a few years later. Really? Oh. You, could you could check IMDb. You, you yeah, I, I could do that. that. But as, as I think back on the time uh, in the Toronto audience, I was uh, a, almost a single non-Greek. And I'm thinking of your reference to uh, the, the audience's jury. Yeah. And, the, and I so I was in amongst many, many, many expat Greeks. Oh, yeah. Many of whom I believed were of the age to have experienced the, the, the late 40s Civil War. Yeah. And of course, seeing the other films around them concerning other uprisings in, in East West Berlin, and, and uh, prior to that, the Hungarian Revolution. And then uh, the Czech Prague Revolution, if you will, in 68, 69. Um, the audience came out of that. I, I do remember very clearly. The audience came out of that film just raging. I mean, they were they were a jury unto themselves and uh, just horrified at what had happened. Yeah. So that <laughs> it, it was a swarm fell spill out into the into the street, and uh, it was screaming and hollering, and it was a, a an audience jury in effect. That's just an observation. I, I remember that very clearly. I clearly don't remember the date quite. I thought it was 69 in Toronto, but I think it may, well, as you say, have been a little bit later. But there, I just wanted to make an observation. Yeah, um, like in, uh, in Roger Ebert's, uh, like basically contemporary review of the film, 
he loves it and he calls it unbearably thrilling. <laughs> and like watching it today, I'm like, it, I like it, it's good, but it's certainly not unbearably thrilling. So it, like from my perspective, it's hard to judge, you know, like what effect it would have had on audiences in that movie. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting to know. Yeah, just a little slice of then life. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Patrick, um, thank you so much for sharing, taking the time. Well kind of had to, but uh, for sharing your work with us today and uh, generating this discussion, it's been a real pleasure to hear your work. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And I'd like to really thank everyone else uh, for coming. Um, I took the liberty of putting some of our upcoming events in the chat. Uh, our next talk will be tabling uh, Pure Wall, Torn Intimacies, Lawrence Hill's memoir and the interruptions of black uh, indigenous miscegenation. Then we have Savages and Sauvage, Amerindigenous Characters in French and English Colonial Satire with Rob Twist. And then our um, Northrop Price Center annual lecture this year will be given by Professor Allison Matthews David, who some of you may know here in Toronto. She did the book uh, Killer Fashion and we'll be hearing from her new project on, it's called The Scarlet Thread Unraveling the Fabric of Crime, where she looks at, um, yeah, um, forensic forensic fashion and, and garments and things like that. And then last but not least, on the 30th of March, our NFC undergraduate fellow presentations. These are always fantastic. So I really encourage everyone to mark that down and drop in if you can with our undergrad fellows. So next up will be next Friday at 2 p.m. with uh, Tavleen. Hope to see you all there. And thank, thank you very much for coming in. Ciao.